Hi, I'm Mimi Gerges. Susan Johnson Cook was ambassador at large for international religious freedom. She's a pastor, author, speaker, and she's running for Congress. It was written as a position for a conservative to be in government. I here came as a black Baptist pastor from the Bronx, got women to the table. Women had never been in the foreign policy, national security discussions around religious freedom. When I sat down, the meeting began. When I stood up, the meeting was over. Welcome to the Mimi Gerges Show. When Dr. Susan Johnson Cook was sworn in as U.S. Ambassador at Large for Religious Freedom in May 2011, she was the first woman and first African American to hold the position. She was the point person for the Secretary of State and the President on all issues related to religious freedoms around the world. She's a longtime pastor, speaker, and author. Her latest book is a collection of devotions for and by women of color. It's called Soul Sisters. Ambassador, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. You are running for Congress. I am the 13th Congressional District. And in why would you do that? The, you know, the disapproval rating for Congress is 80%. And I'm hoping to make the approval rating that high. So you know what? I've been in government. I've served two presidents of the United States very humbly, summoned from Harlem in the Bronx to work with President Clinton on domestic policy, and then President Obama and Secretary Clinton for international religious freedom. You know, my position was created by Congress, so many of them were my colleagues. I had to testify before them and have a Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing twice. So I actually know the inner workings of Washington, and I also know the inner workings of my district. And it's very important for people to have a voice at the table. It's very important for a woman's voice to be at the table, which has been lacking in so many ways. In this particular seat, there's never been a woman. It's the first time the seat's been vacant in 46 years. And so someone has to be a moral, ethical presence, and someone has to get some things done. So I hope to turn that around, and I hope to represent my district well. So Charlie Rangel holds the position now. He's retiring. He's retiring. First time in 46 years. Yes, he's been there a long time. Half century. Do you think that he'll endorse you? Well, actually, he's already endorsed another candidate. But okay. you know, there have also been some problems historically with his seat. And so I'm hoping to be the fresh vision, fresh voice, not the machine, not more of the same. I think it's time for people to really have someone who's representative of the, the entire district. You know, he came from Harlem, and certainly the seat's been held by people from Harlem. But the district is much wider than that. It's Washington Heights. It's Inwood. It's El Barrio. It's Kingsbridge. It's Bedford Park. And someone has to be the coalition bridge builder, and that's my brand. That's my MO. And so we have to represent all of the people all of the time. Are you going to win? I'm going to win. <laughs> Let's talk about when you were ambassador for uh, international religious freedom. What was your mission? My mission was, first of all, I want to thank President Obama for appointing me, Secretary Clinton for nominating me. My mission was to promote and advocate for religious freedom all over the world as part of the Un Universal Human Rights Declaration that all countries agreed upon. And where it was not happening to bring that advice back to the president in terms of what should be done, I had an annual report and all 199 countries were part of my portfolio. And so we found where, where religious freedom was at its height, you had extremism at its lowest. And so what my job was to really prevent what we're seeing now, ISIS and Boko Haram, to talk government to government in terms of what we could actually do. And so I went to 27 countries in my four and a half year tenure, and it was quite an honor to be the diplomat, the lead diplomat on religious freedom in the world. But why did the post stay vacant for so long? Because people were saying that Obama just didn't care. That's not true. You know, I mean, he came in, there were a whole lot of seats to be filled, and there were a whole lot of people that were actually blocking a lot of his appointments. I mean, I had to wait a year and a half for my appointment. It only takes one senator to hold your vote, and one senator did, actually. And at the end of the 111th Congress, which I will never forget, actually, if your nomination doesn't hit the floor of the Senate, it expires. And so after a year and a half of my life coming back and forth from Washington to New York, and you're on your own dime at that particular point, then I had to get a second hearing. So a lot of it were people blocking it, and we had to kind of unblock it. We had to work and, you know, make sure that I could get a second hearing, and then you I know, passed unanimously. That blocking was, you know, they were, uh, they were very critical of you, saying you did not have the right background for this job. And you that reversed as soon as I got in the seat because the same people who were saying that actually were like, you're one of the best we've ever had. So I think it's a matter of people getting, having a chance to know you, and I think that's why I'm a bridge builder. I had to cross both sides of the aisle. It was written as a position for a conservative to be in government. 
I here came as a black Baptist pastor from the Bronx. And so in that world, many did not know me, but when I left, they surely did. And I provided so much. You get one or two deliverables, and I got so many people at the table, pastors at the table. When you're talking about religious freedom, if you have no faith leaders at the table, how do you do that? So I think it was brilliant, actually, that he appointed me in that role. I got women to the table. Women had never been in the foreign policy, national security discussions around religious freedom. I came in and I left a different way than I came. And people who actually criticized me actually applauded me. And some of them are actually friends and relationships that I have now built in this area. You know, but it's not easy being publicly criticized like that. No, Hearing but publicly that you're not qualified or you're not up to the job. How did you handle that, just personally? Well, you know what, number one, if you're a leader in, a public, in the public service and public sphere, you've heard things before. You actually stay focused. I read Game Change, and it was one of the best books I've ever read. And it talked about when President Obama was actually what they call the underdog. And, and they talked about him, and he was in the third place, and Edwards and Clinton were at top in the forefront. And then slowly, he said, I'm going to stay focused on my issues. He says, I'm going to tackle the problems, not tackle people. And that really is kind of how I've adopted my life. I've just said, you know, I'm going to tackle the problems. We've got a lot of problems to tackle. If you allow me to get in, I know that I'm going to make a difference. And that's exactly what happened. When you're a nominee, you cannot talk to the press. You have to basically just talk to the State Department and the White House. And that was my role. You understand you stay in your lane. And when you have an opportunity to be in the driver's seat, which I did, it makes a difference. So all of a sudden, if you see all the pictures that are in my portfolio, all of a sudden, many of those who criticized me were like, can I have access to you? <laughs> can I sit down? Can you make an appointment with me? Can we bring in this particular group? And I made sure that we did. So you just stay focused on what you're supposed to do. Stay in your lane, and you leave a different person than you came. Somebody said this about um, international religious freedom. We have to balance urgent U.S. security needs, including our need for allies in the war on terror, with America's heavy responsibilities to speak for the voiceless. So how do you do that, given that these, um, what we'll call countries of particular concern, mm -hmm. Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, um, Iran, we need a lot of those countries. Well, there were eight countries of particular concern when I was in office, and I think there's the same. I was China, Uzbekistan, Saudi Arabia. I was able to go to four or five of them. And so you have to, first of all, have an opening, and I think that's where being a faith leader was so important. Because no matter what the religion is, there's a respect between and amongst faith leaders all around the globe. They had Googled me in their research, and I had Googled them. So as I sat at the table, there was at least the common respect, and so doors were open. How do you balance it? You have to have an opportunity to talk to one another. That's what diplomatic engagement is. Let me speak, let me hear you, you hear me. And then from then we begin to say, how can we solve some of the problems? Some countries moved a little bit in the forward movement. Some moved a little backward. And that's why we had the annual report each year of all 199 countries in the world. And most people didn't want to be or stay on that country of particular concern. So some small steps. So help us with small steps in terms of getting to the larger steps. And in many cases, that's what we recommended. We had toolkits that we recommended. And so some receive them and some don't. But I think diplomatic engagement is about can we move forward? Can we take those steps? There used to be a game we played as children, mother may I? Mm -hmm. and it was like, yes, you may. Well, what can I do? Well, you can take a small step towards me. Can I take a larger step? Yes, you can. And I think you begin to do that, and we see a difference. There's, it's a very complex issue. It's not something that can be solved in one visit, sometimes not in two visits. But America is having dialogue on many issues. For some countries, they're talking about international religious freedom. For, with some countries, the same countries, they're talking about oil and economy. So you have to understand where it fits on the totem pole at the time that you're going. Sometimes I was the advanced person for the president who was going. Sometimes I was the advanced person for the secretary. Or they may have gone prior to my going. It's really a matter of who is the principal. And one of the things I learned being a pastor, um, being a leader in a community, is that you have to understand the principle, and that's the PAL principle, and you always keep your principles, P-L-E-S principles. But, you know, I was going to represent the President of the United States and the Secretary of State. What their mission was for me to accomplish and me to go and exchange, that's what I followed. And I was honored absolutely honored to be at the table. When I sat down, the meeting began. When I stood up, the meeting was over. That's a major accomplishment for a girl from 144th Street in Harlem, New York, 
walk-up tenement to be able to be at the table, and more of us need to be there. But isn't this a, a largely symbolic position? Not at I all. I mean, we just say, well, we condemn in the strongest terms the violators of religious freedom, and in the end, nothing really changes. Not at all. It's not symbolic whatsoever. Actually, a lot of work and advancement gets... The thing with religious freedom, it's not like the media. In the media, you want to have headlines and you publicize. Religious freedom is the opposite because many lives are at stake. There are families who can be killed or persecuted if you say the wrong thing and if too many people find out. There were families that we were working on for a year, two years, that we were able to get out. There were pastors who had been in prison, Saeed Abedini, others who had been in prison for years, that we had to take small steps on our part and quiet steps on our part. So no, it was not symbolism. Actually, there was much activism and we had to do it in the right way at the right timing timing is everything and so you have to rely on the president and the cabinet who surrounds him that's the defense department and all the people the players that make up these roles they understand how the globe is operating and their secrets that they cannot convey to the public that's why it's called trusting the leadership that we voted in and so uh, you have to also trust the leadership that they assigned to do the role. We understand what we can speak on publicly and we understand what we cannot speak on and you have to trust that so that people's lives will not be in danger. Did you feel like you had the resources and the access to do your job properly? I did. You can always use more funding. You can always use more people around. But I had a staff of 16 who worked extremely hard on the entire regions of all the world. And you did you have access to the Secretary of State? Always. I did. Yes, very much so. From the first day. And my first week on the job, my first trip was with Secretary Clinton to Istanbul. So I think you have to understand, again, the timing and who they want to go. If, that, if I was with her on every single trip, there wouldn't need to be a separate ambassador and separate secretary. There are times that she needed me to go, and there are times that she needed to go, sometimes the president needed to go, and I had to trust the judgment of when those times were right. I was working for the principles. I was working for the president of the United States. So it wasn't about my opinion. It wasn't about what I thought was the right timing. It was about all the meetings that had happened. We had meetings daily. We had meetings when I was in, in the country daily. Uh, we had meetings when we were out of the country daily. And so we were always in communication with one another. And so, I had to trust their judgment because that's who we elected into leading our nation. So now walk me through what you would do on one of these foreign trips. Because as I can't, much as I can publicly give. But I would say, but I you can know, imagine you would go and say, hi, I'm here to talk about your problems with religious freedom. <laughs> no, that's not what a diplomat says, right. you know. I mean, when it's called diplomatic engagement, there's the understanding that there's some things that cannot be conveyed to you publicly. Sure. And we know the media takes things and runs with it. So we understand <laughs> that. I was in the media for, for five years. So, but a, a basic day in the country was being briefed on what was happening in the world. And the State Department deals with what's happening in the world every single minute of every single day. So you know there are explosions, there's ISIS, there's Boko Haram that's going on every single day. We weigh what's the priority for that particular time. When I came in, literally the month I came in, the governor of Pakistan had just been killed and another prime minister had been killed because of religious freedom issues. Because of their opposition to blasphemy. Exactly. Laws. And apostasy. So we had to deal with that because there was a trip planned for me to go to Pakistan. Well, that was not the right time to go. If their lives were in jeopardy and other lives were in jeopardy, so the State Department had to make a decision when it would be the right time for me to go. And sometimes it's not. So a typical day would be being briefed, finding out what happened in the world. And for my particular team, what was happening in the world as it related to international religious freedom. Sometimes there were parallels with other parts of the State Department, but my role, my lane was international religious freedom. Overseas, before we went, we would have briefings again, but we would also meet with the embassies. The embassies of the United States are the ones who receive their diplomats and their ambassadors. So they would have also, you know, surveyed the situation. They would have already talked with us in terms of the timing, and sometimes they had to call it off even after we were ready to be at the airport. But we had meetings planned sometimes, most times with governments, but also we had some meetings planned sometimes offline. And again, if you shared everyone you met with offline, their lives would be in jeopardy. But we did it very sensitively, we did it very um, strongly, and we did it with knowledge. We didn't just kind of, we weren't spontaneous, we didn't act, react, you know, emotionally. 
you reacted in terms of what the knowledge we had, and then many times we had to come back and we had to testify before Congress. Because Congress created this position in 1998 under the International Religious Freedom Act. President Clinton was president, Secretary Madeleine Albright was Secretary of State at that particular time. So Congress wanted to know how we were moving, if we were moving in line with what they created. And then there was also the Commission on International Religious Freedom. What is it about religious freedom that scares these governments so much? Well, you know, some governments are religious states. As you know, uh, in the Middle East, they're like, we've been this way for 600 years. You know, we were an Islamic country. Um, so I can't answer what scares them. What I can say is what can nudge them. And what happens is many of their residents um, actually are trained now here in the United States. They return home, and so they've seen their countries kind of stay as, you know, a time warp, and they try to nudge them. Well, their countries say, well, look, this is the way we were when you left, and this is the way we are when you come back. But, you know, each generation nudges a little more. I towards mean, I, freedom. Towards freedom. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting in most of the meetings, and usually I was the only woman at the table. Not the only woman in the room, but if there were other women in the room, they sat in the outside seating and they were not allowed to speak. I remember seeing in Saudi Arabia women's eyes, you know, behind their headpieces. Because that's all you can see. That's all you can see. But they would pass me a business card at the end of the meeting, you know, very discreetly. And it was sort of like, speak for us. When you have the opportunity, speak for us, speak to us. Um, but speak for us. And so I have actually come back home and created an organization called Pro Voice, Pro Boss. And it's four women of color who are leaders who don't always get to the table. But it's what can we do to help you get to whatever table you're trying to get to, whether that's the corporate table, the diplomatic table, the religious tables. Because I've been in arenas, you know, I've been a religious leader, I've been a diplomat. I've been in arenas that have been the all boys club, and even running for office now. So because I've had not just success, but the word access, which is the word you've already used, is what I try to help other women who want to have that same thing. So why did you resign in 2013? Well, you know, most ambassadors stay two or three years, so I don't know why so much attention was to mine, <laughs> actually. It took me a long time to get in there. But most ambassadors, if you look historically, Ambassador Andy Young, any of the ambassadors, it's, it's an honorific position. You're not going to stay there for life. We're not foreign service officers. But I had a very particular need. I had two sons in college, and you cannot make, because there's no conflict of interest, you can't make extra money, you can't do outside activities. Right. My gift to my children, which I decided as a mother, was to give them an undergrad education without loans, yeah. debt free. And I think you make those decisions that are called life decisions. Of course, the media wanted to pick up on it. That means I'm a very controversial figure. <laughs> But um, well, I made you're the used to that. I'm used to that. <laughs> and I made the decisions that were best for my life. I do not allow, allow the public to make decisions for my life. I am a public servant, but they can't decide for me. You mentioned the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Yes, yes, and sir. they, in 2016, they put out their annual report calling ISIS that they are perpetrating genocide against Christians and other religious minorities in Iraq and Syria. Now that we have that designation, what is the Obama administration supposed to do about it? Well, I was out of government by the time this report came out, so I can't advise the, gov uh, the president on what he's supposed to do. I will say that there's persecution disproportionately to Christians around the world, and someone has to really zero on it, in on it. Um, we visit, one of the things that we can do is visit the diasporas that are here. For example, in Iraq, we visited with the Chaldeans that are here, and outside of Detroit in those arenas, there are large populations. And we also call upon those who have come uh, escaping persecution to also help with us in terms of their relatives and their beloved ones that are still there. So I think it's going to take a coalition. It's going to take an approach that we know not the answers of. Otherwise, we would not see so much in terms of ISIS. I think, you know, the Defense Department has to decide how do you fight this. This is an ideology. So how do you fight this? It's not just a war as we understood it before. These are religious wars and people who are willing to give their lives for it. So it's going to take a different approach than we had with the Vietnam and with other wars in the past. It's going to take a different approach. I don't have any easy answers, and I think no one else does. It's very, very complex. But one thing I do know is that you have to have religious leaders at the table to discuss religious issues. And I think that's what's now been institutionalized. And I hope that that will continue. And I understand that it has continued, the different coalitions that we built institutionally within government. 
And you also have to have public-private partnerships because the government doesn't have enough to do it on our own. And that was also established within the State Department. So I'm hoping that the future will be brighter than the past. But right now, we have a lot of work on our hands to do. And it is a very, very dire situation. You were um, chaplain for the New York Police Department. Very much so. During 9-11. What was your experience there? What were you doing? Front lines of 9-11. That was my first experience with what we now call counterterrorism because uh, we were called on the front lines literally the day that it happened. And so at that point, it was the recovery effort and trying to find 26 police officers who were missing in action. Um, and certainly at that time, it was very, very bleak for 60 days straight. You know, they were pulling bodies out. We were counseling not only the families of those who were missing in action, but we were counseling people like the 9-11 operators, who people were on the phone calling at the last minute, their last hour, saying, help us. And then the next thing they hear is that person not speaking anymore or screaming because they're being incinerated or screaming because they're jumping out of a window. And nobody had listened to them. Nobody had really thought that they were having post-traumatic stress. And so they called for me, Chaplain Johnson Cook, at that time to come. And so for about six months, we had to help them develop a new normalcy, help them get the help that they needed, you know, with trained counselors and post-traumatic stress. And then we had to have some counseling because it was really, sure. we had not been trained for trauma. It was really bleak. But, you know, I was on the front lines then, and I think that was one of the reasons if you go fast forward to being ambassador for international religious freedom, I think you start juxtaposing those two things. What we created out of that horrific, horrific experience was called the Partnership of Faith for New York City. And rabbis and imams and Christian pastors all came together and said, it's not just enough for us to preach in each other's pulpits and exchange that way, but we have to understand each other and each other's cultures. And we've also got to protect one another so that we can't allow anybody's faith to be dumped on, but how can we find common ground to help people live a new normalcy? And so that was the beginning, really, of my bridge building across religious lines. That was my beginning, really, of being part of the UN General Assembly. And I think that there's no accidents in life. And that was really the, the seed that was planted for me to be ambassador for international religious freedom. And I think that's the same seed for me to run for Congress, the bridge builder. We can no longer run along race lines, the Latino against the African American, against the white. That's not gonna get us anywhere. It's like who can bring us together, find common ground, fight for all the people of this district. And that's why I'm running, because I care. Your latest book is called Soul Sister. What makes somebody a soul sister to you? The subtitle is Devotions for and from African American, Latina, and Asian women. And this and is And so it. you left me out. No, not at all. <laughs> Did you mean to? <laughs> not at all. So women of color, you're in the next volume. This, okay, there'll thanks. be a volume two. Um, but you know, again, it, was, it came out of this whole, people had stopped speaking to each other in the very same city. And it was like, why? And so women got together through this pro-voice movement and said, let's sit down. We all have children. Some of us have sons who are black, black and brown, and, and so they're being stopped. You know, they're being frisked. They're afraid of walking while black or walk, driving while Latino. How do we as mothers, as women leaders, who the community respects to have a voice, how do we come together? So this is from our places of our soul. You know, we all hurt. We all cry. So the chapters are on love, laughter, loss, um, aging letters to our sons that we want to write, letters to our daughters. One of the most poignant pieces in the volume is on loss, and it's by a woman named Lucia McBath, whose son Jordan was killed at the age 17, what's called a loud music case in Jacksonville, Florida. He was playing his music and somebody came and shot him. So it deals with the issues of gun violence prevention, but it also is a mother who lost a son as a teenager. So she wrote a letter to Jordan as though he were here now, what she would want to say to her son. I wrote letters to my sons who are here now, and I talked about you know, how you want them to be strong enough to know how they're loved, but also able to go into this world where they're not going to always receive love. And how do you balance those two things? How do you mother and not smother, because they're becoming young adults? So those are the kinds of things that are in the book. And then there's a 47-year-old woman who lost both of her parents before the age of 20. So she was 14 years old without a mother. And this was the first time she was able to talk about losing both parents. And then right next to her, and it turns out living in the same building development, they did not even know each other, as another woman who just lost both of her parents. So we find in the sharing of stories from our souls, 
that healing happens and hope happens and deliverance happens and that sisterhood happens. So we've had a release in New York, we've had a release in Washington, D.C., and it was, we had the women read their own pieces. Sometimes there was not a dry eye, eye in the house, sometimes we couldn't stop laughing, sometimes we were just like, yeah, go girl, bye ya chica. Mm -hmm. And so it was a wonderful, wonderful experience, and so I hope the book continues to do well, as I hope it will. You know, Ambassador, you've done a lot in your life. Yes. Um, you've had a lot of accomplishments. What are you most proud of? I'm most proud, I would say the highlight of my life, number one, is that I'm a faith leader and that I understand that there's a higher calling. So I moved by what I call divine movement. But secondly, the moment I became a mother was a very important time for me. My family is always going to be first. Uh, before all the public things happen, my family is going to be first. And so I remember the moment my mother standing over me as I became a mother and having the three generations there. Those are highlights for me. And then, of course, you see people's lives change. You know that you've had your handprint on. And so people in the room were talking, at the book releases, were talking about what a difference I made in their lives. And I had forgotten them in terms of my instant memory. But they didn't forget But you. they didn't forget. And so when you can see <clears throat> someone's life change and 9-11 operators who call for you, say this is who we want to come and help comfort us, and you can bring hope where there's hurt, that's helpful to me. Ambassador, thank you so much for being on the program. And thank you for doing this and having me. You are wonderful, and I appreciate your having me. This has been the Mimi Gerges Show. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Leave me your comments there. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next time.